I was muted. So, <laughs> hi, my name is Tanya Pinkins, and I am pleased to uh, be joining you today with the second in a series of six conversations with brilliant Black women. There are so many, we can't possibly get to them all in uh, six weeks. But um, this series is called Through a Black Woman's Lens. And our first episode was with a Theater Communication Guild in partnership with Howl Round. We had it during the TCG annual panel. And we were in conversation with Nicole Hodges Persley and Monica Indunu White and Garlia Cornelia. And we were talking about access to theater and Hollywood. Now I'm excited today because I'm going to be in conversation with three brilliant black businesswomen. And I wanted to have these conversations because in this moment where everybody's asking for what they want, black women are always supporting everyone in getting what they want. So I know that when black women get what they want, everybody will have what they want. So join me in welcoming my guests, um, illustrious guests. I'm going to begin with um, my, my newest, the person who I know the least, and her name is Deshauna Spencer. She is the founder of Quelly TV. I am a subscriber. If you're not yet, become a subscriber because there's so much extraordinary content there. So please, Deshauna, join me now. Um, and uh, thank you so much for joining today and being in conversation with me. My next guest is my second newest um, friend, and her name is Lauren Ruffin. She is the uh, co-founder of, of Fractured Atlas, and she is a, a lawyer, and she runs Crux, which is an XR uh, company, which I had to learn what XR is. It is the umbrella for VR and AR, and it is content creators in that medium from the diaspora, and there's so few of us, so please join us, Lauren. And uh, my next guest is, is a, a, an old dear friend, no, not old, a, 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 a longer time friend of mine. And um, we met at uh, NTI, the National Theater Institute. She does anti-racism training around the globe. And she's currently uh, in residency in Costa Rica where she's writing her book about her work and she's on staff at Yale. So join me in welcoming Nicole Brewer. Hey, ladies, where are we in the world? I'm in New York City, the unceded territory of the Lenny Lenape, uh, Natikoke, Mahican people. I'm in New Mexico. We are home to 19 Pueblo tribes who are most certainly still here on the land, although they're still fighting for their sovereignty. I'm, I'm in the DC area, um, originally from Memphis, Tennessee. And I'm in the Guanacaste region of uh, Costa Rica. This land has been stewarded for the last thousand plus years by the Turotega people. And um, I live in DC, right? Which land is uh, the Pescado Way. And so when I'm gonna put that into space as I'll be heading home in a few weeks. And for people who have accessibility issues, I wanna say that I'm a, a heavy set brown skin woman with uh, golden twists and I'm wearing uh, purple lipstick and a purple wrap dress with a lot of cleavage right now. This is Tanya. <laughs> That's such a delicious accessibility. Like find me in the screen when you find <laughs> deep right cleavage. I'm gonna, put, I'm gonna put mine up for the for the folks. Um, I'm gonna find I myself in it. I would if I could, but bras have been done since 2019. I'm oh, not, this not, <laughs> not a real bra. It's not real. Nothing this one ain't real. <laughs> it's for 10. Make me feel like I'm being professional. Yeah, Put that oh, in there. Sure. <laughs> so um, what brought me to this moment of being able to even be in conversation with you is that I became a business owner for the first time in this last year. And um, the fact that I wrote, produced and directed my first feature film and um, we're going to show a preview about it and I'll talk about my experience as a business person and then we'll get into your experience. So Krista, would you please show the trailer for Red Pill? I was muted. 
So I don't know what's happening. <laughs> Just one quick second. Okay. We're, um, we're learning. We're learning to do live. And um, I always say that I'm always willing to put my foot in my mouth or make a fool of myself for the sake of uh, making connections to people. So um, here we are creating right here on the spot with you. And that has, uh, it has, it has its errors. And I think the most successful people I know have failed the most. So I'm going to say that uh, before we see this red pill trailer that this was the most liberating experience of my life being the boss. I was not trained to be the boss. I was raised to be a good tool and I was a great tool. I built lots of castles for people and I, I know how to do my job well, but the experience of being the person who had the final say was profound. And it, it has made me have to question whether I want to do anything else ever in my life. And it was astonishing to me, and it still is astonishing to me, um, how many obstacles people put in my path to keep me from success. And the way I chose to uh, look at those was that I was like, I'm having too much fun. I'm going to jump over that. I'm going to go around that. I'm going to go under that. I'm going to go through that because you're not snatching this joy from me. I see why you've been holding on to this. This is just too delicious for me to let anything that you want to throw in my path stop me from having this experience of, of, of getting to see my vision birthed with clarity, not having to answer to anybody about what it is, not even trying to please people. And in fact, getting great delight when um, some people would, would, would watch it and say, I don't, I don't like that. I, I, that, that isn't right. And I would be, oh, you, you don't like it? What else don't you like? Oh, that is good. That's good. Because now you know how I feel when I watch most things. So yes, it's working. Um, so that's part of the experience for me. Are we ready, Crystal? Should I keep going? We are ready. Okay, let's watch this trailer for Red Pill. We are a majority in this country. And we're going to win the election. Do you know what the red pill is? A red pill is someone who infiltrates a group and then destroys them from the inside. This place is spooky. Take it easy. You know what, guys? I'm going to go back tomorrow. <laughs> I think we should call the sheriff's office. What is that? What do we do, Amelia? We die. But we take some of them with us. So that's my, my little baby. I, I have to say that birthing that was as thrilling as birthing my four children. And the question I first want to put out to you is, have you all had the experience of people wanting to um, support you in doing what they want you to do, but not support you in doing what you tell them and show them that you want to do? <laughs> like they want you to put your brilliance on their stupidity rather than support your brilliance. Anybody? I mean, I'll, I'll go first, I guess. I, I had the great privilege of being raised by a man. Um, and so I was, I was always taught that when somebody tells you that you're being selfish, it's usually because you're not doing what they want you to do. Mm. <laughs> and that has been, especially, you know, when I was in my twenties, it was hard in my, but once I hit late twenties, early thirties, I just, that kept popping up. And that's, you know, sort of what, what liberated me was really having the language and, and growing up with someone who did a lot of things that were, were unorthodox, who did not, um, took really great care of me, but also took really good care of himself in a way that only men do. Mm. And that was my role model. Um, so when I was in my 
once I hit that point where I realized I was making more money for somebody else than they were, and I was, cause I was managing everything. I was seeing the budgets, I was seeing the work and I was seeing what I was bringing in. I was a lobbyist at the time. Um, I was like, I gotta go. Like, <laughs> and as I was leaving, they told me that if I was, as I was going that I was, I was not, I was being selfish because I wasn't, I wasn't committing to the vision that we had had. And I was like, that's not my vision. And I was like, my father always told me about that word selfish. You got to watch it when people throw it at you. So, you know, that's, that's, that's sort of my entry point in the conversation. Oh, I love that. I love, love, love that. Deshana. Trying to beat myself. I apologize. Trying to beat myself in. I was a little slow on, on the gun. So I grew up in a very different household. Um, both parents, but I actually grew up in a very religious household. Um, and I would say somewhat chauvinistic. And so um, for me, I actually felt powerless as a woman it used to really irk me, right? So I remember growing up and thinking, well, boys, they have all the access to the world. And if you're a girl, you only can go so far. That was actually my mindset. And it wasn't until I got a little bit older, I want to say high school, like literally things started changing me. Um, and I'm not sure if I should tell a story. So I don't want to like, that like because you know you love your parents you don't want to like you know say anything that's gonna offend but one day because my mother my sister um they they don't drive like I'm the only form female in my house who actually drives and so I remember when I was 15 years old I was nervous about driving my my mother wasn't driving my sister my older sister wasn't driving and I never forget my dad's a he's a he was assistant pastor or like a social pastor at the time and he my brother and the pastor of the church were walking up this ramp they I could see them they couldn't see me and my mother uh well my mother she was trying to learn it's like we had a little dent in the car and and the pastor was like I heard him saying so um um minister Moore that's my main name Moore um I see that you know the car is dented and um your wife is trying to learn how to drive and my dad said them girls not gonna ever learn how to drive it's gonna be me and my son Willie and my dad says they've never, I've never told this story out loud, out loud to them. My dad has no idea that I heard him say that, but it shifted something in me. Um, literally at 15 years old, and I was determined not to be, you know, whatever my, whatever they thought of me, especially in the church is being less than. And so I went to my mom, it's like, I want to learn how to drive. I want to, I, you know, I got a job when I turned 16, I, I bought my own car. I, you know, pay for like literally once I took, cause I couldn't wear pants either. Like I was, I couldn't wear pants. I couldn't do anything um, that m most normal teenagers could do. And I just like, I want to do this. I want to do that. And I just started shifting uh, <laughs> to my mindset. And also said, why can't I be more than what I see? You know, I didn't have a lot of women who I looked up to who I could say, yeah, I want to model that, especially in my environment. And I just said, I want to be my own role model. And I started focusing on that um, as I got older. And I would say that's sort of my story where I did not have someone telling me that, you know, you know, don't be, you know, you can be, you know, hear the like selfish thing that uh, Laura was talking about. I didn't have those types of conversations. It was a very opposite thing for me. You should, you know, women should be quiet. Women should, you know, women should know their place. I mean, I mean, I wasn't told that specifically, like women should be quiet, but just sort of how um, how I felt and sort of how I was interacting with growing up, that's sort of how it came across to me that only women had their place and men had theirs. And I and I was really jealous. I was jealous of my brother. Like I wanted, I, at one point I wish I, I wasn't a girl. Like I know it seems crazy, but I didn't want to be a girl growing up. I wish I was a boy because just so I could... <laughs> just so I feel like I could be normal, you know, um, like other kids. And, and so, or I could have um, better access and do more. And so now, you know, as an adult, one of the things I, I get really offended when, as a woman, you'll be surprised at things that men tell you I um, as an entrepreneur uh, at meetings. And <laughs> uh, one time I was at this, at this event and this one brother, he wasn't that old either. He's probably maybe 30s, 40s. And we were all sitting around. I'm the only woman in this group. We're all in this industry, in the streaming industry, the only woman in this group at this meeting. And he was like, does your husband know you up here doing all this like this? <laughs> and I was like, what? My husband, does he know I'm here? 
yeah, he dropped me off at the Metro. Like, he, he, he wears Quincy stuff every day. Like, of course he knows I'm here. And if he didn't, he's not my daddy. You know, like, I hate this whole, and I just hate the aspect of sort of, I think a lot of times men want to be fathers to us instead of being, you know, like, helping us sort of get to, you know, they don't see us as an equal. They see us almost like, we, I'm, you know, oh, aren't you a little cute little girl who's trying to build something one day? Um, and that's been my biggest dilemma, but I can, I can go on about stories I've experienced with, and I'm not man bashing because my husband's great and he's not like that, I'm not all men are like that, but I've definitely had, you know, a lot of issues, you know, as a woman uh, trying to be entrepreneur and and people not seeing me as a full self, only seeing me, oh, you're a woman and, you know, you should, you should stay in your place, you should stay in your, in your role. So hopefully I answer your question, hopefully I go for yes, too far. absolutely. Nicole, so you having a, uh, uh, you probably went from pre-pandemic, not many people wanted to hear from you and your business to, so tell us. <laughs> no, I think you just named it, right? So just putting that in the space, I think, the offering that I want to bring is like present tense. I am in this moment dealing with the situation of um, people who wanted to work with me and utilize whatever I'm bringing, right? For their own needs. Mm. But I was very clear in the beginning what it was for me and what I needed addressed. And when they came back later and was like, oh, we're not going to do that for you. Then I was just like, damn. Okay. Instead of what would have been, which would have been like, okay, well, what are these new rules? What are these new terms? And what are these new conditions? And so I think a bit of what's happened is the sheer amount of work that I have that has created a sense of liberation financially, that's actually not connected to any institution has also liberated me and where I work, right? Because now, like before, um, there was this sense of scarcity and like also a real need of to supporting my children, <laughs> bringing money in to take care of my kids, right? And so there was um, always some bending in my own boundaries to be able to make ends meet. That's not necessary now. Um, my, my business itself sustains me. No other affiliation even comes close um, to what my business does for me. So um, I think that there is a certain uh, freedom in what you were talking about, Tanya, of being able then also to take uh, people's critiques who don't ultimately matter. <laughs> in terms of how that decision gets made or how you show up in the world for me anyway, that has allowed me to be more assertive without apology around taking up space, holding space and drawing more firmer boundaries about what I need, right? And making sure like I was clear. And if, if that's not something that you can meet, then thank you very much. I'm going this way and you may go that way. Yeah, so that's where I find myself right now. You know, folks always say, oh, we need we need their mentorships. We need their investments. We need, we need, we need, we need their whatever. But Lauren uh, said something to me when we first met about what, what, what the Black community has. And I would love you to share it with, uh, with, with people listening today. I, I talk so much. Did I tell you about our income? You did. That's what it was. Yeah. That's what I want you yeah. to share. I, I'm always just rattling off random shit. Yeah, but it was good shit. So, yeah, that. <laughs> but no, people are real quick to tell us that we need stuff from them. And I take a totally different, what's well, not a viewpoint, it's just looking at data, um, which is that Black America was its own country. We'd be the 15th most, you know, the 15th wealthiest country in the world by GDP. Um, we actually have a ton of wealth. We don't organize it um, often, we don't invest it. And when we have it, we act like white people with it. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think, I think that's the thing that we need to, um, that we should think about. And I'm, and y'all are all, you know, sort of storytellers and story makers in a way, way that I'm not. Um, and I, I think there's a, what, I, what I'm thinking about a lot is around narrative. You know, why have we let this, the scarcity and sort of poverty stricken narrative um, last for so long? A couple of years ago, black, black, black families before the pandemic, 
black families were the, the fastest growing families that were reaching $200,000 a year. Um, you know, we were really doing it. The pandemic obviously um, has, has, had a, has taken its toll, but, you know, I tend to be generally optimistic about us in a way that I think a, a lot of us have internalized not to be. That's a good point. I was going to um, piggyback on this. I, I remember early on um, doing pitch competitions and I would get these interesting comments from, you know, white investors asking, can black people afford Quilly TV? <laughs> and I'm like, it's five nine dollars a month. We can afford it. <laughs> we're, not, we're not destitute. And, and, and I would tell people one reason I started Quilly TV because I wanted to change the narrative about what it means to be black. I think that um, for too long, we bought, even our own, even ourselves are bought into the narrative about, you know, who we are, we're, we're poverty stricken, we're, you know, we're, you know, we're uneducated, all those things that um, the media has pretty much portrayed about the Black experience. And so whenever I do these uh, pitch competitions, I end up sort of changing the narrative in my pitching to say, this is what Black people in America, this is, this is, this is what we're worth. This is what, you know, the fastest growing economies half of them are in Africa, you know, in Latin America, um, some of the fastest growing middle class, they're, they're um, black Brazilians. So I, I, I give the extra narrative to let people know that you're false <laughs> about, you know, what, what you think um, the, you know, the wealth of the black community is. And I think it's a really great point. I also do think that we don't really spend money like we should in our own communities. And, and I've been trying to even focus on that with V by partnering with, with more black owned businesses because I think, you know, we will kind of, we will come up once we really start to invest in each other. I always tell people all the time, I've, it's been very difficult for me to get investment dollars and I'm not going to wait for a bro in Silicon Valley or a bro in LA to determine my success, right? I'm gonna, you know, bubble gum, spit glue, whatever it takes to hold the company together. Like that's what I'm gonna do. But I swear a bro in, in, in Silicon Valley would not, you know, tear me down. And it shouldn't have to be like that. I think we should, you know, use our resources um, to build up our build up our businesses, especially our, our black media. There's so few of us that are actually black on, and we we should make sure that we're stick around as long as possible. Now, your audience, Nicole, is is you know not so much us. <laughs> so, <laughs> talk to us about that. <laughs> It's, it's funny that you say that because my audience is, I, I get people who say all the time, like, um, they'll go, this ain't for me. Right. Or I don't need to show up to this. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, you absolutely do. And I, and I, and I say that from a place of being like very grateful for the time that I spent at Howard as a student and as a faculty member, the way I said. <laughs> Please believe it. Um, if I was at home, I'd be reaching for my H2 shit. Uh, but, you know, it's like the ways in which colorism and anti-Blackness played out within that space and that type of um, favoritism and toxicity that was happening, as well as healing, joy, like all of these things, right? Um, that needs, that, that work needs to happen. Like there needs to be an analysis of how we are locating ourselves in relationship to one another. And I'm saying that throwing myself under the bus as after I came out of a predominantly white institution and then went to Howard and was hired there, first of all, black people gave me every opportunity and risked on me before white people would even give me a glance. And so I will, will forever like be grateful for my beloved community in that way and the way that they continue to support me. But I was trying to teach that toxicity to them black bodies and them students was not having it, right? And so it was that where I had to kind of come back to myself and was like, wait a minute, what's this work that I need to do me to me? What are these toxic narratives that I am trying to pass on to them that aren't actually useful for their artistry or their craft? And so the work that I do, I'm thinking about black people and it's interesting, you know, Tanya, you said, if you take care of black women, everybody else will be taken care of. And in my work, I'm taking care of black people. And it just so happens that what I am offering is also useful for white people. They, they like what I'm offering too, <laughs> but it really was like, 
what is the information that Black bodies need me to need me to either say right on their behalf because it would be too risky for them to say? Mm. Or what what are the questions that they need to be thinking about so the next time an intern comes in, they're not trying to work them like a motherfucking mule for their last dollar, which happens in some organizations and institutions, and then treat them like shit when that person is like, wait a minute, is this how we go treat each other? Mm. You know. Mhm. Mhm. Yeah. That's a lot. I I was thinking about the fact that we have this wealth and that we don't think enough of ourselves to invest in ourselves. I I think about it even in terms of the the theater community and the fact that with all the wealth that Black Hollywood has, we don't have our own national theater or endowed theater or Black uh, you know, for the fact that we are the majority, we are the global majority that uh, that our content has been blocked by things like uh, Babu of the Pan-African Film Festival had us read this book called The uh, Undeclared War by David Putnam about how Hollywood is the propaganda arm of the government and how the U.S. government requires uh, countries that give them financial that they, we give aid to, to give uh, you, the U.S. as much as 85% of their film market, so long as those films are promoting American values. And we know American values are anti-racism, so anti-race, anti-Black. So like for me being in festivals this year, I saw Black content that rivaled anything coming out of Hollywood. So when I hear us complaining about what we have, why don't we make this? It's not that we're not making it, it's that they are blocking us from getting our work seen. When I talk to people about VR, XR, they say, oh, that's a that's a white boy, that's a white boy world. You, they're, 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 I mean, literally, that's it. That's a white boy world. What, what, what y'all got to say? There's a, first I wanna say, um, on the black entertainers, black celebrities and everything else, there's a, a writer that I love named Max X. Gordon, S. Gordon. If he's here, if you listen him, please holler at me because I've been reading your shit forever and I'm a huge fan. I talk about it all the time. He wrote a piece a couple of years ago, this, it's called Desecrating Black Art. And he uses a Jay-Z and Beyonce as, you know, as an example. And he asked this question that I can't let go of, which is essentially as, well, one, what do we do with the black capitalist? And two, as black people and as black entrepreneurs, because the country was built on our, you know, my great, great grandmother's free labor, do I have a duty to build companies that pay black people fairly? Like, is my, is my duty to fair labor and to, and to practices that are gonna be good for us, is it actually rooted in our history as free labor and a commodity in the country? That shit stays with me all the time. And the answer to, once we get to the bottom of that, we can have black institutions. Mm. You know what I mean? Like once we can really unpack that, like as a, as a community, we get to have, we get to have that, that stuff. Um, white folks have are removed an, enough now and have managed to create. Um, I, I I I don't under I don't understand why we we have people we have black billionaires now, um, like Bob Johnson. Bob is building hotels for white people. <laughs> Do you know? Like I just like what a waste. Um, so that's I so that's one thing. On the on our communities thinking about digital content and where we're going, you know, Tanya, I love how you're jumping into the XR space because the stories are important. It's important for us to build those skills. Um, and we need to lead with the stories because of how you get people into an industry and young people in the industry is with storytelling and art. But the long form is spatial computing. All the stories we're telling right now, it's, the, it's where computing is gonna be in a decade. And if we don't use the stories now as an educational entry point, for people, if we, like those of us who are here can't like get people into doing AR, get folks into coding and that sort of thing, we're gonna get left behind with the next, the next level of computing. And that's why white boys are excited about VR and AR. They know that that headset is actually the computer that we're all gonna be working in in 10 years. Mm. And, that, and that AR spectacles, Snapchat spectacles, that's gonna be this, dec this desktop computer that I'm on. And so it's a long game and we have to get out of our, our bias. Why are, you know, people, why are you doing this weird shit? It's my family. My family's like, yeah, you're doing well for yourself, but I don't know what the hell you do. Um, <laughs> nice house. What is this? What is a VR AR? You know, like whatever. Um, 
but it's, we have to get out of that because it's everybody else is thinking, I shouldn't say that. Often I feel like I'm having conversations with people that I have a lot of respect for who try to shit on the things that I'm trying to build because they just can't see a couple steps ahead. You are a visionary and you are already into the future because you have a pattern mind and you see where that's going. Like people always ask me about Red Pill. Did you write the ending after the 2020 election? I'm like, no, I wrote the, the film two years before the 2020 election because I could see that that was what was coming. But that you, was inevitable. Was that a vision or was that just you paying attention? I think it's, it was like, uh, I, I like the Aboriginal concept of pattern mind. Like I see the pattern. The patterns are there. For me in 2016, when people were talking about Hillary, I, I was just like, she couldn't beat a black man. Why you even imagine she gonna beat a white one? It, it, it was like crazy to me. <laughs> but people treated me like I had two heads or with contempt that I could be so stupid as to think that that orange person could win. But it was like, that is already done. That, that future is already written. <laughs> So how do you find your content for Quelly? I mean, like, how did you do this? Nobody's done it. it the film business has been around since me show. How did you do it, Deshauna? Like, nobody else has done it. Oprah didn't do it. Bob Johnson didn't do it. Well, he started every movie channel. So <laughs> that's not all Black. So he, he did start a streaming service. Um, so for me... I have a background in film or television. Um, my background is in journalism. I'm a storyteller. And I just wanted to see myself on the screen. I always tell people, you know, I just started by initially talking to content creators. I think a lot of times in, I, I created something that I wanted to see. But I think that, you know, what makes Chloe TV successful, or at least, you know, our goal to success is the fact that, you know, I had numerous conversations, at least, you know, 50 to 60 conversations with um, Black content creators when I was initially coming up with the ideal, asking them what they want to see. You know, um, if you had a streaming platform that focused on you as a content creator, you know, how you want it to look? Um, what would be equitable to you? You know, uh, versus like this, I'm going to create this. I haven't seen this film. I, heard, I saw about it on Shadow Knack and I selfishly want to watch it. So I'm going to start the streaming service. Yeah, initially it was part of that. Um, but at the end of the day, I really wanted to create something that um, Black content creators could be proud of and they can say, um, I'm on this platform, I get treated fairly, and I want to share, you know, with everyone else. And, and you're the only distributor that I know where people tell me they get checks from you. Yeah, <laughs> and, right. I mean, seriously, um, we, I meet mean, so many filmmakers are like, you know, I've been on this platform, I haven't heard from them in two years, I don't know why my film is doing like, Take it off, what's going on? And so as someone who's a creator, I, I never want to, especially, you know, like what uh, Laura was mentioning, when I, when I tell people that I want to give 6% of our subscription revenue to our content creators, I get a lot of negative feedback uh, from investors, from people like, that's not how you become rich. That, that's not how capitalism works, right? <laughs> um, I see Clotivy as more of a co-op, right? Where we're, you know, we're sharing the love. If it weren't for our content creators, there would be no Chloe TV. So why when I didn't make that film, they did. So they deserve to have it. And so how I started, you know, um, I would say ignorance is bliss <laughs> because I didn't know what I was doing, you know, to be quite honest. Uh, I had an online magazine initially. and I knew how to start an online magazine. I worked in publishing for a while. Um, and I just started, again, talking to filmmakers, talking with tech people, people who were full-time stacked. Um, full, full, it's not full time stack, but full, something full stack, whatever you, Laura may know it's called, what's it called? Uh, <laughs> full stack devs? Yeah, full stack, yeah, yeah. What is that? Uh, people, is that? Wait a minute, you just said some words. Full, we might uh, full stack developers, they're people who, who know multiple languages, they, they can do the whole thing for you. Very languages, exciting. you mean coding languages? Yeah, very. So like, like I, I just want to one minute, we have the full package here for the world. Like we got Nicole here who can do the anti-racism training to train us out of our colonized minds. So we can undo that. We got 
Deshauna here, who's going to help us get our content into the world. And we got Lauren here, who's helping us see where the world is going so we can get our foot there. We can be on the moon before, before the moon is there. So like, this is a, this is a conversation right here, because all of the pieces are here right now. <laughs> Right. So full stack developer, they can do front end and back end and they can, and, and they know various languages. And so um, our initial beta was done by a full stack developer. I always tell the story that um, the developer, I found a developer through a friend who was also, he was a front end developer and um, this full stack developer ghosted on me. Um, I would say 90% of, of the platform was done. And I decided to launch Clay TV anyway. There's this quote by the co-founder of LinkedIn who said, if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you started too late. And that was highly embarrassed uh, by the first version. It could play movies. It, it could take people's money, like the basic, you know, I can't do anything else with that. And um, I had to let go of perfection because I feel like, a lot of, like, you look at the first Facebook or the, any of the first versions of any product, they all look like crap. But I think, you know, as, as a Black person, especially as a Black woman, sometimes we feel like we don't get as much grace. And so we feel like it needs to be more developed and, and be a better product than maybe when Mark Zuckerberg was able to pull. If you look at the first, like, Amazon, you know, it wasn't as high tech and there weren't trucks all of day one uh, with Amazon for Amazon Prime Day, right? It was a very basic website that you can buy books from. Um, and he got grace, right? Uh, we don't get that. So I had a lot of anxiety around that. But at the end of the day, I wanted to prove if people wanted, I wanted to prove people wrong. Do, do Black people like anything other than sort of like mainstream content? You know, the reality shows that were really popular back in the day that people told me that oh, I need to have, I need to have ratchet content. All I think is people said that only Black people want to watch when we have been able to prove that we like documentaries, we like to learn, go figure. You know, that's our number one genre, documentaries and sci-fi and uh -huh. uh, number two. And so um, I was able to prove that point and I was hoping to get funding, which I'm not sure if we're gonna talk about some of the challenges that black women face when getting uh, investment dollars, but um, I launched it with it being looking like crap. And again, despite lack of funding, I've been able to you know, build it as organically as I can. I, I love that. You know, I think that perfection is the devil. And sometimes when anybody waits till it's perfect, it's not ever gonna get done. Mm -hmm. And so many times, you know, when I finished my movie, I know that if a, a white boy had made this movie, oh my God, he'd be a superstar from, from what I did with 10 days and no money. But people be like, oh, we just, we just wish you had, had had a bigger budget. And I'm like, give me a, give me the budget. I can remake the movie with a bigger budget. Okay. Oh, well now, now that's not really what they meant. It's like, you know, they always got a story for you about why they can't do what you want them to do. So Lauren, I want us to get into the future. How are we gonna get there, Lauren? Cause I, I, I'm loving VR, XR, but you know, I'm old, my brain and I'm not gonna code, but I wanna get there. As you see, I want, to, I want us to be in the future and we gotta have some VR, XR on Deshauna's platform. So how are we gonna, how are we gonna get there? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a couple of things. First, I mean, I, I think the technology matters so much less than being able to tell a story. You know, when you go to film festivals still and where they're having XR festivals, they have a lot of people who know the tech, but who don't know plot, who don't know character, who don't know how to tell a story. So I'm, I'm of a mind that the tech doesn't matter if you've got a good story. Mm. We've always been so good at telling stories. Like we've never had that problem. Um, so I think that's the first thing, but I think collaboration, right? Like, you know, I'm, there are people who, and, and Deshaun, I don't know if you know this, there are people who ask me about your work and I have nothing but good things to say about you because Crux is in theory, it should be, it's a platform and we're cooperatively owned. Um, I, um, but there are people who, who do that. You know, what do you think about what Deshaun is doing? I think it's fucking dope. I'm, I'm hoping I can invest in, you know, like, <laughs> I think it's what's up um, and vice versa. Because I think that there's so much money out there. There's just so much wealth. Um, there's no reason why we should be fighting over it. Like there really isn't. Um, and I want us to have all of the platforms that are owned by black people and owned by black artists in particular. And I want them to make a whole bunch of money so they can start their platforms. I want black ass punk platforms with streaming music. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> I want black anime. I want all that shit. Yes. Um, 
And so, I mean, that to me is the future. It's really like, you know, just getting out of the mindset that we have to be competitive, that we can only have one thing. You know, we can actually have a whole lot of things if, if we want it. Um, but on that, on the investor side, Tanya, that um, I'm at the point now where I tell people like, I don't need anything from me but your money. And I'm hard to manage. Like, I don't even play. Like, if you, if you can't just give me your money and leave me alone, then I can't deal with you. If I need your help, I'll ask you for it. But what I'm asking you for right now is money. <laughs> you know what That's I mean? Preach. <laughs> Ooh, you know, I had that conversation with Rashad Robinson because Color of Change is trying to go into the theater community the oh, way they, they are. are. That's Hollywood. interesting. And I was like, look, Rashad, we, we don't need no more jobs. We don't need mentorship programs. We don't need, we need them to just give us the money to make our own things. Put some Broadway theaters in Harlem and Queens. If New York is Broadway, Broadway needs to be in Brooklyn and Queens and the Bronx and all those places and just give us the money and we will make the stuff because all of American culture, everything you're selling in the world, it, it began with us. And I love what you talked about with the money thing. Someone said to me today, Europe built its wealth in 3,000 years. The U.S. built it in 200 because of the free labor. And that the whole idea with the free labor is they found that they could give them enough food to eat so that that would sustain them, but that was less profitable. It was cheaper to let them starve to death or die and replace them than to actually give them enough to sustain them. And that colonial slave model has moved into capitalism. It is always cheaper to replace your labor because they think of us as a replaceable endless supply of us. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, and we think that about ourselves too. I'm fascinated by what's happening on TikTok. Have y'all been following the, the TikTok dancers who are striking now? No. What does that mean? TikTok dancers striking. Oh, so there's the black creatives, right? What do you say? Black is that the black, the black creatives who are, who are basically not, not on TikTok right now? Yeah. I'm not on TikTok either, but I'm just, again, like, I'm nosy. I just like, what are these young people doing? <laughs> What are they doing? What are they doing? So, oh, right, I should tell you what they're doing. Um, <laughs> um, so whenever there's a song that comes out, black people make a dance, they don't make any money off of it. And then white, uh -huh. people, and make shit ton, white people take the dance and make a shitload of money off of it. So Megan the Stallion just came out with a song and black TikTokers are refusing to make a dance to it. And it's been out for, I think like close to a week now and there ain't no dance, and white people are, these white TikTok dancers are trying to make a dance, and it is ugly. <laughs> That's just so weak right now. <laughs> it is, it's so ugly, and it's hilarious. It's like hilarious to watch them flail. Oh my gosh. Oh. Can I just say, to like, to your point, Ruffin, even the anti-racist theater with me, like, moving that into a larger platform to make it a, a class that was available to people, I had a sister friend who called me and said, Nicole, I just got off a call with a lot of people. And these folks is up here talking about anti-racist theater and ain't nobody mentioned your name, right? And so I've been doing anti-racist theater for three years, like specifically using that phrase or terminology in the field um, when other people were still full on working and not using it. And I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Either I'm gonna get out here with an imperfect product and share what it is that I've been doing on a large scale platform. My shit's about to be co-opted by white people and I'm gonna be left at the dust, um, you know, being told, oh, we didn't know. We didn't know you did this. One That's of your NTI students is gonna be out there teaching it and saying they learned right. from you. <laughs> you know, you know, so it's like, that. that is real. The ways in which our imaginations are already set up for us to dream of futures to dream ourselves out of whatever our situations are. And whereas, you know, I don't necessarily know that that is true for, for those who fall within the umbrella of whiteness, that they don't need to have imaginations that are dreaming of better because they've already arrived at their top or whatever that is. I'm gonna say something and I wanna know what you guys think about it. I just watched a brilliant uh, film called Uprooted, The History of Jazz Dance. It, it, it doesn't have distribution yet, Deshana. And it is tracing jazz dance all the way back to the African continent. I, I know the people and stuff. I got a private thing for it. And 
one of the powerful things that, that they talked about and that Dr. Greg Carr talks about is we as a culture, as a people, we are a people that it's about generosity. You know, we are always giving and sharing and that other culture is about how can I commodify and repeat and make money off of it? And in this jazz dance documentary, you see that all of the greatest dancers, they didn't start schools. They was dancing and you could come and be with them and dance. And then somebody would come in and, and get about a 10th of it. They, they couldn't do what the person did, but they could pull out like 10% of it. And they would start a whole school and books around the world about this 10% of this thing. And, and, and then you have all these things and then no, nobody talks about or elevates the names of the people who were doing it. But we know that this is infinite. Like this thing that's coming through us is infinite. So we, we will give it away. We ain't worried about writing it down because it's changing as I share it with you, it's gonna become something else and you're gonna make something else. And we're not trying to distill it down into something that is less than what it can ever be as it's flowing through us. What do y'all think about that? Can't hear you, Nicole. Oh, I'm amen and you. I'm sorry. I'm just over here like, what a way to work. A word. The only small thing I always say, I always tell people that, you know, black people, we're the seasoning, right? You know, for, on everything, you know, and we, we sprinkle our seasoning on some on on dance on music on art um and we do it sometimes free right and and kind of what we mentioned with, with tiktok um or or instagram or, or every other platform we give them away our seasoning to and other people are capitalizing on it and um and that's why this conversation is also so important because i think that the reason we give away for free because we think that by giving away for free we will eventually get get seen get known uh, or be seen right um and and then they have i call them the colonizers who come in um and sort of hijack it and then they're the ones who who capitalize off of it but i think that you know if we continue to do things like what the young tiktokers are doing and saying you know what i will no longer add my seasoning to tiktok so you can go and take my seasoning and use it and capitalize off of it I'm gonna just give it, you know, keep it to myself. But I think at the same time, we need to figure out a way, okay, if we keep it to ourselves, not to say we have to build our own TikTok or anything like that, but just making sure that we're, we're able to make money off. I also think that as a community, we need to speak up more. When we see colonizers sort of hijacking things and taking it and making money off of it, I know that people did speak up. I guess it was like maybe Early this year, late last year, where there was a TikToker, a young woman, she was doing this dance on one of those late night shows, and and it was actually some black girls started it, and um, people were vocal about it. Like, why weren't the originators of this dance? Why weren't they on? I forgot what show it the show it was, but people spoke up about it. I think they eventually, um, I'm not sure they came on, but they actually gave them recognition, and the girls who started dance recognition. So. I think the more we speak out about it, I think those things will eventually change, hopefully. I just wanna say that for everybody listening, we are gonna have questions um, that you can put in the chat and we will give the questions to um, the ladies, the women who are here with me today. And I do women with a W-O-M-Y-N because we don't need a man in it. Um, so put your questions in the chat and we will, um, we will, we will answer them. Um, so what do you, I know, we know what Lauren wants. She wants your money. Just give her the money so she can keep on moving us into the future. But I want to think about, like I always say about money, you can't eat it, you can't drink it, you can't wear it, you can't build a house out of it. I want us to somehow, because um, we got to get out of this capitalist model. You know, capitalism is built on expansion. There's nowhere else to expand. And um, I want to know how we're going to, we're going to move out of that. Like I, I look at the, the, the Bitcoins and the, the cryptos and I'm like, they're going to hate it and they're going to try to kill it because if LeBron James makes some gym shoes and you can only buy them on crypto, buy, buy dollar. Uh, I'm looking to how do we start moving into money is some made up thing. Like, okay, I'm going to put your movie on my thing and you're going to give me childcare or I'm going to put my movie on your thing and you're going to cook for me. And back into this this sharing of resources beyond this invention that is enslaving us all 
uh, Greg Carr told me this morning, like when um, the Civil War happened and they freed the black people, they told him, you know, you know, keep working this land and um, then we'll pay you. And it's like, we're <laughs> we free. They tow up them cotton gins. And then they said, no, 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 uh, keep working the land. And, and then we'll give you the money to buy the land. Well, we can work it and we can, we're we going to be able to own the land. Okay, well, no, we're not going to pay you, but you can own the land if you work it. So these Black people ran those plantations at a profit. That's how well they ran those plantations. And of course, Andrew Johnson comes in, you know, withdraws Sherman's field order, and we don't get anything but we know how to work. We know how to make things. We built this whole this whole world here that, that people are living on. We built it. We know how. I always remember that they have destroyed everything we built and they keep doing it. And I don't think they can help themselves. And so Tony K uh, K Bombera said in the opening of the Salt Eaters when the woman was being healed, do you want to be well? Nicole, do we want to be well? I can't speak for the we, but I know I do. <laughs> I, I am seeking wholeness. I really am. And when I think about the, the culture that I grew up in and American capitalism, I think about capitalism as a spectrum. And so what I understand of capitalism today is an overuse or um, a hyper capitalism. And so I don't think that I have ever been alive when capitalism has been used with balance. And, and so I'm wondering what that would be like um, as a culture um, to be able to kind of get back to a, a place of- Capitalism is built on infinite growth and you cannot have infinite growth in a finite system. You know, I, I wanna just put out there, Tanya, for me, that what I'm just saying and offering is that where we are at is extreme and where it has always been, has been extreme. Because anytime you're, you're growing off of free labor, anytime you have enslaved a person and robbed them of their personhood, like that shit is extreme. I have never lived nor seen in history books how capitalism functions in a balanced way. So like the theory and the practice from what I understand of capitalism have never been in alignment. It has always been far skewed. And so what I'm putting into space is like, I wonder what that is to have balance. I know that as I'm working in contradiction in capitalism, because that's where we're at. And so I am a part of uh, a capitalistic system. I am helping to gatekeep and support and prop up a capitalistic system. That the best ways that I can try to seek my own wholeness is to make sure that my money is intentionally going to Black people and that I am not just you know, running to some place to give my streaming service so that if I can afford uh, $14.99 for Netflix, can I afford, you know, the smaller, much smaller price, uh, Deshauna, that you were paying? $49.99 a year, right? Please, please, yeah. exactly, <laughs> please. Um, the fucking CSA in DC that I was belonging to was like $400 for six months of fresh vegetables, cut it out, right? So how do I make space for supporting in that way? But also, I am very much too of a place of just shut up and give me the money. Uh, there has been so much mistrust that we need some type of guidance and how to spend the money that we need questions. I mean, I just applied for a grant where I'm being questioned about who I said I wanted to come down to Costa Rica and have uh, a relationship deepening time with. Mm -hmm. I'm being told where this person lives or where they don't leave, live and how this trip was not necessary. And I'm like, shut up and give me the money. I'm not lying. I'm not distrustworthy. I, I, I am in the realms of whatever this is. And yet you are questioning money that's not even yours. You were simply the gatekeeper to saying yes and no and cut the fucking check. And so I always try to do that. I try to like make money, yes, for myself and to support my family, but also for my community. And where can I do that without people having to know that that's what I'm doing, that I'm donating my money to this place, or I'm bringing this person in regardless if I need them or not, uh, because this institution was willing to pay me the money, so I'm going to bring you in to do this or that. I'm dropping names, like roughing you name that. That is so important for us to learn how to shine each other up and move away from scarcity. If I can't do it, someone else can do it. I shouldn't be doing it. And so what I want to make sure that I'm going to like say, this person is doing this thing, let me like even if we don't agree with everything. And so I'm kind of getting to this place of, 
Um, I don't know what's on the other side of capitalism. I, I wanna try new models, but right now um, what I'm trying to do is be healthy to my community. That doesn't have opportunities because we're so oftentimes perceived incompetent. And I'm tired of that too. And also how we can sometimes like not bring them young folks around. I'm quick to name young people as my mentor or young people that are, are whispering wisdom into me that I'm folding into my work, but I understand that I have accrued power, positionality, privilege. And so people are willing to listen to me or make me more credible, right, to them. Uh, that's actually not true and not real. So yeah, you're right. I wish I, wish I could. <laughs> I wish I could burn it all down. <laughs> But you say this, you know, for me, making Red Pill was about the fact that despite, you know, my 50 years in this industry, I still find that I walk into rooms of people who do what I do and I'm not listened to. I speak and there's silence and then they move on or I'm invisible or, uh, you know, nobody looked me up before I came in the room. So there's an assumption that I don't know or couldn't be, um, uh, you know, that, that sense that as a Black woman, we do everything and so we are completely uh taken for granted because everybody knows we are atlas and we are not ever going to let the world world we're not gonna let it fall we're not gonna let it fall we, we we're not we're not constitutionally capable of that so people can rely on that but as we are all saying we, we're tired of that so we're gonna let it fall i think it's an interesting question because I think about it, again, raised by a man, men let things drop. They sure do. They let, they let shit drop. Mm. People pick it up and find a way. They're angry about it. Um, so I, I think about, I actually say in, in both of my companies, and I, I wasn't one of the, I'm not one of the co-founders of Fractured Atlas. I'm one of the co-CEOs right now. Gotcha. Um, and so and that's important because it's a white-led, it's always been white. Mm. It's, a, it's an organization that was founded on whiteness that has thrived on whiteness. And I've taken it as far as, as I can. Um, and now I'm transitioning out. So I'll be leaving there now, two months. But I think, um, Nicole, to your, your comment about, the, about philanthropy and their suspicion, philanthropy is rooted in, in distrust. If philanthropy really wanted to help poor people and really want to help brown people, there wouldn't be nonprofits. They would just give us the fucking money or, or buy us a house. Do you know what I mean? So like, let's like, let's just cut, cut that out. Um, and I've seen how that works. I'm, I've always worked for pretty large nonprofits, but the questions that, um, that my friends now who run black arts institutions get asked by funders that I know, you know, white organizations with debt, that's a good thing. They're using capital to grow. Black and brown organizations with debt, why do you have debt? Do you pay your debt payments on time? What's your, <laughs> like the questions that my friends get, are really, really, really suspect. Um, and the reality is that if there was, if labor was paid fairly for its, for the labor, there would be no need for charity. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but that's, and I think that's, I was, I was talking to some, some folks out here in New Mexico last week, and we were on a panel about, you know, financial wellness or whatever. And, you know, even the things that people who do well in our community tell people they need to be doing, you know, life insurance, invest in real estate, you know, that's really good for you and your family. That's not structural. <laughs> that's not, that's not real change. Um, and I think that, you know, having to be of dual minds around, I want to, I want to be okay. And I want my family to be okay, but also like the community and the black world and the diaspora has to be okay. It's, I think it's hard for a lot of people to hold those things. Um, and, and to your question, Tanya, I, um, I give a lot of my time, you know, like I think, and like when I was way younger um, and I was working in, with, in juvenile justice, um, you know, time is really important um, and not time like mentorship. I mean, like just straight up time and, you know, like connections and that sort of shit. Um, so I give away expertise, you know, I know how to start a nonprofit, you know, I know how to write a contract I went to law school. So I like I give this shit away to people and, you know, I'm not keeping track of it, but to me, like, you know, I rarely say I don't have 15 minutes for somebody, even though I, I am pretty busy. Um, and I think if I were able to, like, if I spend the next 10 years working my ass off and supporting other people, I'll be able to like have my own non-capitalistic system where I'm just giving my time away. And then the seeds I plant in conversations 
will become cyclical. Like that's kind of how I'm thinking about like trying to move myself out of capitalism. Yes, Ashe, Ashe. I, I, for me, I've got reached a point in my life where I don't need much. You know, my material needs are met. And so when I am spending money, I'm spending it to support uh, somebody's business, somebody's family. Uh, that's what I'm spending money for um, because I'm blessed and privileged that my needs are met. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like the law of life is that there's a flow from this place to that place and that there's a perpetual flow and capitalism is an extraction hoarding model, extract hoard. When there's flow from here to there, it can sustain itself forever. And so when I, whenever I get, I'm like, I need to send it on through because it's got to keep flowing out to other people. I want to say the challenge though, that um, I'm facing as a startup company in capitalism is that our customers are expecting us to be Netflix. They expect us to have the same exact platform as if we are a multi Paying on a platform, we get those. Well, Netflix has this, so why don't you do that? Why are you here? And like, when Lauren's like, well, we need more money. And so while you know, I had this love hate thing with capitalism, and uh, in order for us to compete, that's the dilemma that I'm facing as an entrepreneur. Um, like, how can we adequately compete? How can we? When I talk to customers, I we, I don't want like, well, we only started quickly with twenty thousand dollars, you know? And they're like, oh my, so. I've said that sometimes to the customers and I don't want to like shame someone to stay a subscriber to Quilly TV, you know, like, please, for the love of God, I put myself in a, like, I literally put myself in a ways. Like, if I didn't have a husband, I would be homeless, Sit, like, for real, like, you know, um, and so, and, but we get all these people who want to subscribe, find it nice too much, I, I, I need a better platform, like, well, with what we have, we've been able to do really, really well. And I think that as a community, if we change our mindset and, and grow with the company, right? Knowing that, okay, this company starting here, they're offering a good service. It works. It's not the beta. It can, we can do way more than take people's money and play a movie now. Um, and we've been building what we can. I think if, if we sort of take that, like we're growing together type of mentality, um, I think as a community, we will, we will go so much further, especially with our Black-owned businesses, because we just don't give ourselves grace. And that's why the show me the money is to me, I, I hate to say, oh yeah, just you know, write me a check, blah, blah, blah. But like, yeah, that's reality because you know, in order for us to adequately compete, like we need checks, you know. I if I had the money, I know exactly what I would how I would take the company. I have a plan, like literally have a plan right now. <laughs> but I've only made to do like five percent of it because you know, we're you know, we're barely scraping by. And so um I mean, how do you come back that, you know, you know that you need money, you know that capitalism isn't um, a just, you know, type of uh, future for us, but at the same time, we do need capital in order to even be, to play equally with the white counterparts. This just popped into my head as you were talking, Shana. I want to hear what the other ladies think about it, what you all think of it, but I was like, I, I took this negotiation course and one of the things they said is that people in the West are the worst negotiators in the world. The people in the East, like the Eastern Europeans, the Russians, they're the best negotiators because we want, we care what people think about us and that the, the, the Russians, the Slavic people, they don't care. And that the point of a good negotiation is to destroy the other person's expectation. So if the market is that, you know, this costs $10, and so everybody expects $10 and you're hoping that you can prove that yours is better and maybe get 12, you know, you're expecting them to come in around nine or something. So the Eastern negotiator would be like $2. Now your world is jacked up. You, you off base, you don't even know what world you're in. And so they got you, they got you because you don't even know what world you're in and they're just negotiating, okay? <laughs> and that when someone gives you the price that you want, you got to flinch. Because, you know, people don't want to feel like they, they said too much. So I started thinking about with you and was like, you know, anybody who thinks they can negotiate are going to be playing those games. Well, what can I get? What can I get it for less? And I was like, well, why don't you say um, Netflix doesn't have this? Oh, you said you was missing. You wanted some Black Joy. Uh, does Netflix have 10 Black Joy? Does Netflix have blah, 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 blah. Uh, I should be charging you a lot more. 
This is a bargain. And you know what? In fact, in six months, it's going to be more. Because <laughs> there's nowhere in the world you can get this content. If you didn't see it at the festival, you can't see it. Got to come through me to get this right now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's hard being a good person running a company because you, and I mean, like, if you're small, you're doing customer service. <laughs> that shit is day in and day out, right? Like that customer service, yo, I'd be bad at it because I'm an asshole. But like when I'm, I'm like, when I used to be in an office, listen to people, I would be like, if you don't hang that phone up right now, but, and, you know, we had to come up with a fraction atlas, like actual interactions protocols, which was you, you can't, I, you can't hang up. Like, but I think that wears on you. And so then I'm wondering if, you know, the pricing thing, like, do we internalize our value as being less than? Mm. Cause like, I mean, you know, Deshaun, I think you've built a dope ass platform. Um, so, although I have to revisit, I haven't, I haven't been on in a bit. Now I gotta be better about it to be, you know, totally transparent. Um, but it's also basketball season. So that's where, <laughs> when it's streaming basketball, so. <laughs> Um, but I, I, I just, I wonder about like that value piece and labor and how we value ourselves and, you know, and as women in particular, like, I think we do have those moments where somebody gives us a little criticism and it just really, it really cuts. Um, yeah, but that's why, you know, I think it's important for us to have these conversations just surround ourselves with. with no, one of the, oh, sorry. No, go on. No, one of the things that was, uh, a big, a big hard thing for me, um, but also life-changing for me was um, people not liking the choices I was making, being mad at me, attacking me, and me having to sit in my discomfort of that, in the awkwardness and the sadness, but then ultimately going, people hate the boss, and I like being the boss. <laughs> Yeah. I'm just thinking too about like how I'm trying to be healthy within my capitalism. <laughs> right. So it's like, what is that sliding scale model for people of my beloved community? What, what is that sliding scale model for folks that is always available in anything that I'm doing? That's like the coal run. Um, but also hearing in like the very beginning, people telling me, oh, you should be charging more you should be charging more. You should be charging much more, right? Um, and I'm like, if I charge much more, then I, I scale out people who I'm, I'm trying to actually include in. So this kind of like charge more, get more, you know, Tanya, to your point, um, it's always present and it's always there. And, and what I'm thinking about too, in terms of futures, entrepreneurship, money is how can I, and I don't want to uh, sound like morbid or whatever, like, oh, it's too late for me, but what can I do to help these other generations who are sh like straddled with debt? So I'm 39, right? I've got a, about $143,000 of student loan debt, of which a good, a good $45,000 worth of that is just interest. Ooh. And that well, they particular- can't, they can't repossess your brain. They can't roughen, but I'm also like, what were the conditions, right? First of all, I don't, how is this not a lawsuit? I was lied to. It has been. I was told, it has <laughs> to been. be but, another. Uh, yeah, but the federal government hasn't had one, but all the, all the for-profit colleges have used to represent them. And that's what's, it's, it's all these different sectors of how, you know, how, how folks get got. Yes. You know? Yes. I mean, yes. yeah, I, I just, oh, I, I fucking hate student loans. I hate them. But oh, I can't my. wait for the government to do anything about that. Well, right? I, told, so. I told my students, do not plan your life around paying them student loans. You can die owing them, them student loans. There's a million ways, more than one way to skin a cat. Plan your life around, you are not going to pay them student loans. And you're not going to plan your life around figuring that out either. I would love for us to be able to do that and also have other like pathways of how do we redistribute wealth in a way that takes care of that for people and, and really begin to like level the playing field in housing, 
like owning your own home, whatever that is for you, level the playing field and any debt that is accrued because of um, our systems of racism and oppression, right? And racial caste, all of that stuff. How are we, and I'm gonna speak for my eye, how am I organizing myself in a way where I'm thinking about that and not just being straddled with it? Because regardless, it is something that even though I wanna like just say, fuck it, and I'm not gonna pay it or whatever, I still carry it. And I just don't want my body and my spirit to hold on to that debt anymore. And I don't know how to breathe my way out of it uh, or, or anything else. I just need it gone. We gonna talk. <laughs> We can, move, I love it. we can move that burden. <laughs> um, there's a lot of questions here about funding. You know, um, I'm, I'm going to say I funded my own movie. I funded pretty much everything I've ever done. I work at other things in order to fund the things that I want to do. But I will say uh, from my spiritual discipline and practice, um, there is nothing that anyone wants to do that um, the lack of money will keep them from doing if they intend to do that. And it's how I raise my children. If you want to do it, I do believe that there are resources, ancestors that you can call on and the ways will be made. And so um, I, I wanna say that, and I'm gonna open it to you all up about questioning, but if you want to do something, you can call in all the resources you need and, and, and money doesn't have to be one of them. So funding, you want, people want to know about funding. Uh, I heard you say $20,000, you started Quality TV. I'm yeah, I, I can, yeah, I, I can start it. Um, yeah, I started Quality TV initially, $20,000. I won a competition, a uh, pitch competition. And it's interesting because a couple of years before that was another pitch competition I was, I was in. I lost that one. I was a finalist and they're asking me, I asked why I did not win. They're like, oh, we're not sure about the future streaming, <laughs> which is so crazy. Uh, and just, <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, they were they were definitely didn't have like Lauren's, uh, you know, vision for the future. Um, but I will say that when I initially got to 20K, the goal was to sort of build the beta in there from there, raise more money. Um, but I would say my mindset started to change a bit when talking with investors and the challenges I was hearing back from them um, or what they thought about the community or the type of content they thought we needed in order to be successful uh, for the Black community. And so I started to be more selective about the potential investors that I did speak to. Since coming up with the ideal and being in and out of beta, we've only raised $200,000 and I only got 100000 of that 200000 I got $100,000 a month ago. So literally for the past five years, I had only raised $100,000. That's it um, to run the company. And I got the recently another 100K and that was to hire a full-time person. I literally been running Clay TV by myself. So we talk about um, the ancestors um, and black women doing it. You know, one of the things that I hear from people is like, how in the world were you able to run Clay TV by yourself? I always say that there was something inside of me that gave me the strength to do it because no way in the world can someone have a platform with 500 titles, over 400 filmmakers from around the world, you know, be on all these different platforms on Roku, Apple TV and build partnerships by myself and run customer service. I mean, it's, um, you have to be a maniac to do. And I think as entrepreneurs, you are probably a little crazy anyway. You can be normal to kind of to even be entrepreneur to be honest, but I always tell people there's a will, there's a way. Um, I've met so many people who have tried to start similar things and they just haven't, mainly because they're waiting for some big investors to sort of bless them with whatever. And I never wanted for anyone to sort of bless me with the money to give me permission to kind of move forward. That I said, okay, if I only get 50,000, I only get 20,000, I'm going to run with that money. And as someone who grew up working class, like I can... <laughs> I can strike some money. Um, and that's some, those are some things that I would say maybe the bros can do. They, they raised $2 million and it, it, this shit's gone in six months. You know, <laughs> you know they don't know what the hell to run it, but you know, we can do so much or so less. And so um, that's why I tell people, you know, if you are trying to find funding, um, my, my, I would tell people to just try to figure out how to do it yourself as much as possible and also be intentional about who you get money from because you don't want money from everybody, kind of a Lawrence mentioning. Some people like, 
give me the money. I don't need your 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 insight. I just I know what I want to do. Like I didn't ask you for money so you can be my bestie and come behind me every five minutes asking what am I doing. I'm running my company, right? And so, or people are gonna tell you, you should do it this way or that way. And so it may even dilute your, your mission. And I turned down checks because people wanted me to dilute the whole reason why I started the company. I would never do that uh, for the sake of a dollar. And so while funding is amazing, I think you just need to think about what the mission is. And we talk about capitalism too. In, in the capitalism world, you raise $10 million, you need to sell the joker one day. If we're talking about, you know, having these sustaining businesses that stay black on and, and black led, um, then that won't happen if you get money from certain VCs because they want to see if being sold to Viacom or, or some other company down the line. And so that was also something I've been fighting very heavily for is actually black ownership to control in my company and not having, you know, you know, be a notch on their, you know, some white company belt, you know, to me, because that's what, the black companies are they're not in the belt see we we have diverse function we have this platform um and i don't want to i don't want us to be that i don't want to be the ceo of under above uh, you know, under some other ceo who's you know i want to be ceo of my own company like why can't we build these companies and why can't we work together Kevin lawrence mentioned earlier we can we can create uh, a wild disney where we're working together and collaboratively right it can in you know it could be you know crux quilly instead of you know viacom said yes you know Things like that, and I think that's what we should be thinking about when we, when we want to raise money because we want to think long term um, about sort of you know how you want to see the the, tra the trajectory of your company to go. Lauren, um, so Crux was bootstrapped for the first year or so, um, and Does I was that mean you funded it. Does that mean yeah, 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 yeah? I funded it, um, and I was I was fortunate enough to be able to do that. Um, and and then we got lucky. Um, we've been good. We've we've been treated very well. Um, and then we didn't. We we don't need anything now because the pandemic happened. Um, and one of the things that we talk about a lot is how do you, as a as a black person, hold your success that came out of trauma, mm -hmm. you know, of a of a pandemic, and of an uprising where all of a sudden, and you know, Nicole, like the shit we've been talking about for a while. Now you hear us. <laughs> Um, so, and so we've moved to an earned revenue model and, you know, I've, I'm a fundraiser by trade. So I've always been very good at asking for money. Hold, watch your pockets. Um, cause I will come for them. your pockets will be like, ah, um, but I also like, let's have some fucking fun with this shit, you know, like, <laughs> um, so we've, we've been, we've been fortunate, you know, last year was really good. We're, we're on track to do a fair amount of business this year. It's been a hustle. Like I'm, I'm literally running. I'm running an event right now, um, but it was, it's, it's six figure. It was a six figure event for us. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a, it's a hustle. Um, and I'm, I want it to be less of a hustle. We, it's, it's part of the hustle is um, to, to Deshauna's point about, you know, what we do with, with our, like how much we stretch, you know, like I'm still not taking a salary. I'm still paying my people really well. There was a point, you know, not too long ago where I was like, we might not make it y'all, but the least we can say is we, I, we pay black people during a pandemic. Like, you know, like that's all, that would be, if that was on our gravestone as a company, you know, like there were 17 black folks who made some income during a pandemic um, and were able to do it safely and at home. Um, yeah, so we, we've been fortunate. We've raised about $700,000 so far. We're on track to do $2 million in business this year. Um, it's a grind. And I'm wondering a lot about myself, like my generosity, because I'm generous now because I have a full-time job. Like, am I going to be generous in September? <laughs> 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 you know, like, <laughs> um, so, but I, I don't know, it, it's, it's fun work. It's like joyful work, but you know, on the, on the funding side, we've just been really lucky. And now some of the seeds, the conversation I planted three and four years ago, you know, now my friends have moved into roles where they can move capital. Um, and again, because of the trauma of last year, and I just, I'm trying to figure out how do we find space to process that shit? Like some of us are having some success now and there's so many of us who aren't here anymore. Mm. And you know, like that, that shit, like I think about it all the time. Mm. Yeah, yeah. There's a question here that it says, I've heard the term black people used by all of the panelists. We live in a global world. What exactly falls into the definition of black people? I'm not sure any longer. 
That's a question. What? I don't answer what? that question anymore. Huh? Okay. I don't answer that question anymore. Somebody else take it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think about like, okay. why? We said no. We just said no to that question. <laughs> And the next question is um, for, De for Deshauna. What is the growth of Quelly TV with your various partnerships with Little Rel Howry mean for Black creators on the platform? And what does the future look like for collaboration with other Black streaming services like Afroland TV? Oh, you're muted, baby. Yeah. I was making a mistake. We've been in pandemic for how long? I still make a mistake all the time. Um, so as far as the future um, for Clint to be with partnerships like Little Rail, Little Rail's been really great, um, great partner. I know before we were, we were talking about another potential partner um, that was, did not go out, go over so well. Um, but um, for us, the goal is just to continue to be a space in which we amplify Black um, content creators from across the globe um, and do a number of various different ways on our platform. We're going to be uh, adding audio to Chloe TV. Um, we're actually in the process of revamping our platform so we can have video and audio simultaneously um, and also creating more of a community in, in which um, our content creators and our, and our customers can kind of connect more offline and online. So that's kind of where we, we see things going um, as far as partnerships. Um, as far as collaborating with um, other Black streaming services, I'm always open to collaboration. It, I, I think it just depends on sort of you know, what the overall goal will be, you know, um, you know, for, for both parties, but um, I haven't really had a lot of conversations. I think the, the closest conversation I had was probably with Lauren, with, uh, we were talking about collaborating um, a while ago, um, but that's probably been the only conversation. I always do tread lightly, you know, uh, when it comes to having conversations, um, just because um, kind of like what I mentioned, like the whole Nate Parker thing, that I have had, not to say that in you know, all platforms like this, but I've had, you know, people reach out to me sort of wanting to know information uh, under the disguise of wanting a partner. And so um, at the end of the day, I'm always open to partnering. I don't know what they will look like, you know, to Black streaming services, but it could be sharing, sharing of content. It could be, you know, one of the things that, you know, for, for me, for my streaming service, my, I've always been mission driven. And to me, with so many things happening, um, especially within our community, having Black community services come together and say, let's have a group, let's have a, a, a collaborative event, you know, let's come together and talk about some of these issues together. We can all stream them live on our platform. That's kind of the ways I think we can collaborate um, is by sort of saying, you know, this isn't about, you know, me versus you. This is this is what happened. You no, know, Brenda Taylor, George Floyd, and, and as a community, how, how can we bring people together? And having events that in which we can connect, um, and, and no matter if you're on Afroland or Pulley TV, it's, if it's live event or BET Plus, and we're all sort of allowing people to get the information that they need from any space in which they feel most comfortable with or where they actually are subscribing from. So that's sort of how I see potentially partnering with those platforms if they're open to it. We are in streaming wars, and so uh, that that's a challenge that we're, we're facing right now because it is kind of like every man for himself at this point. And so we have, go ahead, sorry. You switched your language from partnership to collaboration. And I, I loved how you did that because people come to us about partnerships all the time and partnership only happens between equals. Like it's, <laughs> it's not a partnership if you got me doing everything and I'm, we're bringing all the resources. Like when I'm, I very, Deshaun, you're also the only person I've ever talked to about partnership. Like, you know, because I don't, I don't feel alignment with anybody else from mm -hmm. afar, you know, like, but people come to us all the time with partnership and I'm like, oh, this ain't it. So we are, mm -hmm. we are at the end and I have one last question and I'm let each of you have the last word. Um, you know, right now we're in this moment where the um, rule by minority is, um, is getting hammered in hard. <clears throat> Um, if we don't win 2022, um, if they don't get rid of the filibuster, we are looking at minority rule forever. Um, what is that, uh, how are you all thinking about that in terms of being black businesses, this, this sharp turn towards authoritarianism in what had been thought of as the freest place on the planet? 
You're trying to end us on a high note, huh? You know, I'm that girl. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, shit, Tanya, like, it's always been a struggle. I'm, I'm not committed to physically being here. Like, I want to make that really very clear. You, you ain't never lied. Like, I'm, I'm just not, like, at, and this is, you know, maybe ego, but I don't know that I have to give the United States anything else. Like, I just don't think I have to. So, I mean, that's my answer. I've worked in politics. I think you're 100% right. I'm tired of, I feel the same way I did in spring of 2016. Um, and I'm tired of convincing people that. So, and I don't have to be here. Like, you know, and that, that is absolutely privileged talking. But my goal is not to struggle for the next, you know, 30, 40. My, and my mother also died when, when she was 42. And I'm also Nicole, 39. So I'm like, I really feel that time coming up. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to spend my life someplace where they don't appreciate me or my skills and my gifts. I'm just not going to do it. So, I mean, that's how I'm approaching it. I'm prepared for that. Because I don't think, I don't see anyone thinking generationally with strategy who are, who are Democrats in position of power. You know, I don't, I don't have a whole lot of, a whole lot of thoughts. So I'm just, how many people, how can I build a company where people feel like they have a way to go someplace else? I'm, I'm there with you. I know you are. I'll be following your Instagram. You just got back. <laughs> On my way out again. <laughs> oh my God. I love it so much. <laughs> I just feel like there's such alignment between Rafa and me in terms of like <laughs> deuces. Um, and I'm just trying to figure out energetically where that would be um, in terms of I'm not willing to, to give back any time, any time of my life. And I just got done reading an article about life expectancy uh, for Black people uh, plummeting uh, within this time of the pandemic. But I would just say in terms of the government, uh, my accountant uh, kept describing my last year as a windfall year for me. And I have deep love for this human being, but there was something about that language that made it sound like a unicorn, that made it sound impossible to ever make that again or exceed it, that I know was not their you know, intention around it. But I've been thinking about the sheer amount of money that I paid in taxes uh, last year, and particularly in relationship to, you know, the Trump scandal and what he did or did not pay in taxes and how um, I, I need to, regardless if I want to or not, I am at the point where I have to invest in more knowledge around how to utilize the system in the way where it is not that I don't want to pay my fair share for you know services that are being utilized by all people but i would rather have control about my dollar going into my beloved community than my dollar going to uncle sam who's never given a damn about me and so as for my community and so like as i'm trying to figure out this next year for me is around getting more information about organizationally how do i need to show up because the llc model isn't working for me and how to be able to protect myself um, as these people move back uh, into um, power and continue to exert anti-Blackness in every aspect um, of my life. And so uh, that's, you know, what I'm offering into space right now. You get the last word to Shona. Very interesting. After, I'm in the DC area. So, you know, January 6th, they had, I'm in Old Town Alexander, so just across the bridge. And there were a lot of them staying in our neighborhood, so they had some lockdown. And uh, after that, I literally stopped watching. I haven't really watched the news since January 6th, just for self care. Um, I would say this um, I started Clay TV. One of the reasons I started Clay TV was, you know, to see myself, but also to be a safe space. And so um, for me, that has been my mission even now. Like to me, it's even more important to be a safe space for. Everyone, you know, like what Lauren mentioned, you know, is privileged to be able to say, I'm going to leave the country and, and just, you know, F it. Um, and I'll, I'll let them figure it out because I, I'm, I'm the same way. I don't really, I, it's kind of hard for me to see a path forward. I just don't, I'm technically, I'm an independent. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican, definitely a Republican. Um, but 
Um, I sort of checked out with politics. I definitely vote, but at the end of the day, my goal is to make sure for people to have a safe space, to have a safe space to, to escape from what they're seeing on the outside world, and for them to then get get joy, to see black joy, to see black laughter, to see black success, to celebrate ourselves through through our platform. Um, and that's the only way that I can sort of manage what I'm seeing um, because it's super frustrating. But I know that even though I didn't mention some things, the negative things that people say, you know, the positive things that we hear from customers like, wow, you know, I was sick or I was going through this and could you help me out, you know? And so though that's what kind of keeps me going. Will I move out of the country? We, my husband and I, we talked about moving to Ghana as well, you know, possibly. So, you know, that's something we've also uh, talked about. Um, but I would say that's sort of my goal is to be a safe space while people are sort of dealing with um, the realities of, of the U.S. right now. I want to say, you know, I know that your time is the most valuable thing that any of you have and that you are very busy, successful women. And so I am really grateful to you for taking this time to be in conversation with me. So I thank you and, and, and bless you and hope that all that you give returns to you a thousand fold. And um, thank you to everyone who listened. This will be available on YouTube. Um, this series is called Through a Black Woman's Gaze. Next month, we're going to be doing literature and we'll have uh, Alice Randell who wrote The Wind Done Gone and Cynthia Bond who wrote Ruby. So um, thank you for listening today and please tune in in July for the next um, Conversations with Brilliant Black Women. Thank you, ladies, and, and um, please stay on so we can say goodbye formally after Crystal closes the live stream. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>